I'm Sandy Arnett. On this edition of Commuter Connections, we've got an update on transit-oriented development in the region. MDOT MTA has won awards for a number of recent projects. We've got information on that. We'll introduce you to two major facility improvement projects at the MDOT MTA Bush and Kirk Bus Divisions, and you'll meet the new director of Mark Train, all on this edition of Commuter Connections. As a daily transit rider, you may have noticed several transit-oriented development sites in our region, which have merged attractive residential and commercial properties with public transit hubs. It's a concept and a transit life choice many are choosing for its convenience. MDOT MTA Manager of Real Estate George Fabula joins us with a look at transit-oriented development in our region. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So tell us, what is transit-oriented development? Transit-oriented development, or TODs, are a planned, dense, mixed-use development within a half mile of a transit station, which will hopefully increase ridership and also support economic development. And how did the concept come to be? Well, TODs as itself uh, became a plan probably more popular back in the late 1980s, 1990s by Peter Colthrop, who wrote a book about the new American metropolis, where basically talked about creating highly dense use developments around transit areas. And where would you say was like the first development? Um, as far as a transit-oriented development project? It could actually date back to the early 20th century in uh, Minnesota. Uh, their transit, they had over 500 uh, miles of rail for streetcars. And there was a developer that actually owned a lot of land along that transit corridor, and he built up over time. So that was thought of maybe one of the first, um, first TODs that came about. So are there many of them? around the country? There are many of them. Uh, there are many planned for the Washington metro area, which is uh, right next door to us. We have uh, some as well. And also, they stre TOD stretch out from California, uh, Atlanta, and also down in Florida. So what have been some of the success stories in our region as far as transit-oriented development? For MDOT um, MTA, we have a few that we can point to. The Symphony Center uh, TOD, which is next to the Cultural Center Light Rail Station, has, it's in Midtown Baltimore, has a mixed use of residential, office, retail, and also a parking garage. And also we have the Owings Mills Metro Station in Baltimore County, which is at the end of the Metro line. Uh, that's broken into two phases. Uh, the South Parcel, which is phase one, is almost fully built out with two parking garages, a county library, uh, some residential will be, will be coming in the future, and also with some retail and office. And what has been the public's reaction? It's been very positive so far. I mean, what you had beforehand was a surface parking lot that was just serving the purpose of parking, going to the transit sta station to your destination. Now you have many amenities, many options that are available to the public. There is some um, growing pains as a development project does move forward. People are, are used to parking right next to a station and we're displacing them for a short period of time in order to, for this TOD to come forward. So why do you think things have taken off as well as they have with transit-oriented development? Is it for the convenience? That is absolutely correct. Uh, I'll point back to Symphony Center in Midtown Baltimore. You have so many convenient things that are right next to you. You can live, actually jump onto the, um, the light rail station, light rail, excuse me, train. You can go north to your destination or you can go south to your destination. So it's just the convenience of everything that you have all in one, all in one spot. And what role did MDOT MTA play? MDOT MTA plays a role in the pre-development planning for each uh, planned TOD. What we'll do is we'll take a look at a station, uh, how we exist today, and how we think we're going to grow in the future as far as maybe bus or metro or other links that we have along the way. And then we'll develop a plan and we'll present that plan to TSO, the Secretary's Office of Real Estate and Economic Development, who actually puts forward the um, development projects as far as advertisement and also actually negotiating with the developers to bring it to a final product. So it looks like this is a public-private partnership when it comes to the transit-oriented mm -hmm. development. How does something like that get started? It can happen in many ways. Uh, sometimes it'll be a developer that actually will come to uh, TSO Office of Real Estate and present a plan mm -hmm. or maybe a thought about developing onto a site. That may be one, one avenue in which it does take. Or it will actually be a TSO Office of Real Estate. Well, they'll work with the local, either city or county, whoever that may be, about a plan for future development at a specific site. So how do they break out the funding? Each individual site has a, a varying program as far as money. But for the most part, it's a, it's a mix of uh, private equity, private money going into the project. You also have local, state, and sometimes federal money going into a TOD. So are there any 
future projects in the works? As I mentioned before, we have the Owings Mills, which phase one is well underway. Mm -hmm. Phase two, which is on a north lot, will be coming in the future. There's no specific plan or timeline associated with that. Um, we also have Annapolis Junction at Savage Mark Station in Howard County. Um, that is well, well underway. We have a 700 parking space garage specifically for the Mark commuters. And there's some other mixed use development, residential office and retail that will be forthcoming as well. There was a ribbon cutting for the residential component late last year so very successful so far. As far as other planned TODs, I really can't get into that too, too much. Mm -hmm. um, I would point people um, in the direction of uh, contacting our MDOT office at mdot.maryland.gov if they want to find out more information about TODs. Well, it sounds exciting, and it seems like it really is a good move to put the residential business and entertainment so close to public transit. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Coming up next, a look at a number of national awards MDOT MTA has won for transit projects in our area. That's next. Stay with us. A moment in transit. When she was named Manager of Operations for Metro Operations, Michelle Holly not only capped a distinguished career, she made history as the first woman to hold that title. When I first started uh, with the organization, it was called Mass Transit Administration. I started in 1987 and um, started as a bus operator. Two years ago, I was brought on as the acting manager of operations here at Metro Operations, and a year ago, I was awarded the position. As Michelle's profile has increased, so have her responsibilities. My basic role now is to manage the transportation department. That, is, that includes our operators, our train operators, and our station attendants. And I also manage the um, field supervisors, or the field supervision department um, that has a superintendent and four field supervisors. A top consideration for all MDOT MTA employees is safety. Michelle explains how her staff keeps up with safety and training regulations. We conduct training. We have training uh, for them. Um, I'll, we meet with the safety department, um, and uh, we have people come in to provide that training. Michelle's list of accomplishments continues to grow as she recently received a distinguished honor. What I'm most excited about at this time is the Professional Leadership Program for Women. Um, I was one of 23 women selected to participate in this program. Life of Michelle outside of M.MTA revolves around her love of music. I love to sing. Um, I sing in church. Um, I've even directed a choir here and there. Um, I also am classically trained uh, in piano. Uh, so it's been an off and on thing, but um, I love classical music. Um, and maybe one day I'll teach. I will never perform because I only love playing for me, but um, I, do, I do love piano. With the upcoming addition of a new Metro director who also happens to be a woman, Michelle looks forward to leaving an impact on the agency. What I would like to do is to continue to empower other women um, who um, don't feel like they are good enough to um, to get in a certain field. There have been a lot of people who have come this way before me. Um, they have shown me things that I would never have thought I would learn about trains. I also thank the operators. The operators who work with us, they have shown me also just as much as my previous mentors have. And, and I thank them. I really do. A moment in transit. MDOT MTA has made a number of innovative improvements to its facilities in and around the area, which have garnered national awards and attention. One of the awards was for the improvements made to the Baltimore Link West Baltimore Transfer Facility. MDOT MTA Director of Engineering Vern Hartsock joins us with a look at several awards the agency has been presented for excellence. Welcome to Commuter Connections. 
Hello, Sandy. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, MDOT MTA has won several awards, most recently from the Maryland Quality Initiative, the Award of Excellence. And one of the awards was for the West Baltimore Transfer Facility. Tell us a little bit about the significance of that facility and the importance of that award. Absolutely, Sandy. The West Baltimore uh, Transfer Facility is a key component to Governor Hogan's Baltimore Link initiative to transform our fixed route bus service. At that facility, we have about five to 600 bus transfers that take place each day with buses moving through the facility. And if that facility wasn't there, the patrons would be making trips across busy intersections and doing it in a less than ideal and safe condition as they are now. This facility is well lit. It's nicely decorated and comfortable. It provides a layover for our bus operators. Patrons can also purchase fare tickets there and get public information from our signage. It's a major component of our Baltimore Link system. Okay, and when did the facility open? The facility opened in June of 2017, coinciding with the launch of Baltimore Link. So now with the Maryland Quality Initiative Award, how important was that for MDOT MTA to receive the award for the West Baltimore Transfer Facility? The Maryland Quality Initiative Award is a prestigious award. It is an award in which we are ranked against our peers for our accomplishments in major projects that the criteria involves collaboration among stakeholders, including the public, innovation, and quality inherent in our designs and construction and planning of our projects. So it's very important to us. And I know that you also won in, I guess, a couple of other categories. Tell us about those awards. Yes, we also received an award for our bus main shop maintenance facility. This award was issued to us because this facility is a state-of-the-art facility that has 19 bays for repair and inspection of our buses, 10 bays for air conditioning servicing, plus it has administrative offices, training facilities, a machine shop, a welding shop, parts storage, and the functions inherent in this facility previously were housed in separate buildings that were built in 1903 to maintain the electric trolley cars. Okay, that's interesting. Now, have you, has MDOT MTA ever won in, you know, these awards before or won in these particular categories? Yes, MTA has won several awards over the years. Mm -hmm. One notable was a few years ago for our Metro Security and Fire Management System, where we replaced all the fire and smoke detection systems in the Metro mm -hmm. to keep it to be one of the safest facilities in the subways in the country. And a third category, I guess, it, um, was the Baltimore Lake Planning and Program Management. Tell us a little bit about that award. That award was significant. When Governor Hogan announced the launch of Baltimore Link in October of 2015, the MTA had less than 20 months to plan, design, construct, and commission the Baltimore Link facilities. And the planning effort that was done to bring about the West Baltimore facility was magnanimous in that the planning took place throughout the whole design and construction and commissioning of the project, whereas planning usually takes place early on and concludes its operation but in order to deliver the project on time, the planning effort was concurrent with the other activities, and we realized a successful opening on time. That's awesome. What's in the future for MDOT MTA? Are there any other significant projects on the horizon that might qualify for these type of awards? Upcoming, we have the overhaul of the light rail trains mm -hmm. that patrons should begin to ride them uh, this spring. And they are essentially an all new train having all the major systems overhauled or replaced. We're also buying all new Metro subway cars and replacing the entire train control system for the Metro, as well as redeveloping Camden Yard Station. We also have the North Avenue Rising Project. Mm -hmm. Many initiatives are on the horizon that our public will soon enjoy. So what does the engineering group, which you serve as director of, play in the build and design phases of the projects like the ones we just discussed? My office is responsible for the design, construction, and commissioning of all of the major projects that the MTA undertakes. Well, Vern, thanks so much for joining us on the show, and congratulations to you and MDOT MTA on a job well done. Keep up the good work. My pleasure, Sandy. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Just ahead, a look at two MDOT MTA bus division projects making a difference in transit in our region. 
That's next. Stay with us. Facilities at the Kirk and Bush Bus Divisions, which have served the agency since the operation of streetcars, are finally being replaced by new, more efficient, state-of-the-art building and shop facilities at the locations, all to better serve MDOT MTA transit customers on the streets. MDOT MTA Director of Bus Maintenance, Dave Varner, joins us with more on the improvements made at these two locations. Welcome back to the show. Good morning. Thank you. So speak to the important role that the Kirk and the Bush Bus Divisions play for MDOT MTA. Okay, starting off with Kirk Division. Kirk Division is actually one of our most centrally located divisions. It's in the middle of the city. It was you know, built back in 1947, so it's over 60 years old. It's been part of the community for many, many years. The advantage of that is what they call deadhead miles. Mm -hmm. You know, how far the bus, the bus has to travel to get to its uh, you know, starting port or its destination. Mm -hmm. So it saves the state money by being so centrally located, but it's an old facility, been around for a long time, and it's in, like I said, the middle of a residential area. So where is it located exactly? It's actually on Kirk Avenue. It's uh, 2300 Kirk Avenue. So besides the age of the facility, what are some of the other issues that you've had to address there? Well, being built back in 1947, it's like an old house. So all the technology, the heating, the cooling, the whole operation of it is outdated. You know, one of the other things, the new facilities will be fully enclosed, which means you won't see a bus. All the buses are parked inside. Even on the maintenance side of it, all the buses will be inside. So all you'll see is two nice, beautiful buildings, and you'll just see the buses pulling in and out where the old Kirk, they were all lined up out there. So you had 145 buses sitting out there in the middle of the community, kind of an eyesore for them. Mm -hmm. So it, it is helping and it makes us a better partner with that community. And I was gonna ask you, was it more the eyesore? Could it be the noise? All that plays a role into it. When you got 145 buses, you know, right next to your, your house, that can be very annoying. So now everything's inside, enclosed, quiet, you know, and it's not an eyesore. So now when did the work on the new Kirk bus facility begin? It started back in 2013. There's actually three parts to it. The maintenance, facility, which has just been completed, actually right across from the original Kirk Division. Like I said, it started in 2013. We just kind of completed it now. They moved in to mid-January, so it's actually in operation, but it's working right now. That was the first part of it to get the maintenance out of the old building. The second part is we had to find a temporary facility for the transportation side of it, the bus operators, and the storage of the buses and dispatch and all of that. We were lucky. We looked at various locations, probably 20 something plus, and found a place just up the street, no more than one mile from Kirk Division. It's called the uh, Old Anderson Olds Building. And the final part is the big transportation, which they call Phase Two Ultimate. That's where they're gonna take right now and totally tear down the current Kirk location and build that up and it's gonna be a fully enclosed, uh, nice administrative offices, new bus wash, new everything. You know, so it's going to benefit not only just employees, but also the uh, community and make the operation a lot more efficient. Yeah, I was too. going to ask, what are some of the features? It sounds, yeah, that sounds like a lot of work, but it's going to it's be a great. lot. The whole operation now is inside, both on the maintenance side and on the um, administrative and parking side of it, too. So when will all of the work be completed? Phase one is completed. Mm -hmm. The temporary site is done, and we've actually got operations moved up in there. The phase two ultimate is going to take two and a half to three years to be completed. And what is the cost for the work at Kirk? Phase one was around $40 million. That's what we got as far as a federal grant to help us with. I think phase two is more towards $60 million, you know, to get that part done. It's a larger uh, area mm -hmm. where phase one is 100,000 square foot. Phase two is like 200,000 square foot because it's going to house all the buses. Okay. And tell us a little bit about what's happening real quickly at Bush. What are some of the improvements happening there? Well, Bush Street, if you've ever seen it, it's actually down there off of 1515 Washington Boulevard, right across from Carroll Park. Mm -hmm. It's actually where they had the original trolley cars. So our employees are actually working out the same maintenance buildings that they worked on the trolley cars. Mm -hmm. The buildings are over 100 years old. 
So they're part of the historical society, so we can't change a lot, can't touch a lot of it because it is a historical building. So same with Washington Boulevard, because it was so antiquated and wasn't designed to work on buses, uh, we applied for another grant, State of Good Repair, and bought another a, um, a factory that was closing down right there on Bush Street, right next to our facility. And we took that grant and we moved our main engine overhaul shop, our um, rebuild shop, and our air conditioning shop, which were in the old buildings, and moved them to the new high-tech building that they have now, which is actually one of the best in the country. It's got all the things to do, the hybrid battery packs on top, uh, you know, safety, you know, fall equipment for the employees, so it's a safer environment, plenty of room to work, and all modern equipment to work on the buses, too. It's a very, very nice facility. And when will that work be complete? That's actually done. We moved in at the end of um, 2017, so it's fully operational right now. So lots of busy times at MDOT MTA. Thanks so much for coming on and joining us on the show. It's been a pleasure. Just ahead, we'll introduce you to the new director of Mark Train Service. Stay with us. Mark Train has a new director we want you to meet. Being responsible for a rail system that runs from Northern Maryland and Perryville to Baltimore and DC, and then out to Martinsburg, West Virginia, is an important responsibility in rail transportation. Mark's new director, Andrea Farmer, is certainly up to the job for the tens of thousands of commuters who ride Mark each and every day. We welcome Andrea to Commuter Connections. Welcome to the show. Thank you, good morning. So for our viewers and listeners who may not know, what is Mark Train and tell us about the route. Well, Mark Train, of course, is a commuter system. We run on three lines. We have the Penn Line, who serves Perryville, Maryland, down to Washington Union Station. We have the Camden Line, of course, from Camden Station in downtown Baltimore, all the way down to Union Terminal in Washington, D.C. And then we have the Brunswick Line, which actually starts in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and terminates at Washington's Union Terminal. So what's the ridership for Mark Train? Ridership is good. We serve approximately 9.3 million rides a year, 30,000 per day. We have weekend service, which is growing. Mm -hmm. We've, of course, added some bike cars to our weekend service, which is exciting. And you know, we're looking forward to the upcoming Cherry Blossom Festival. That's right, that's a big deal. It in is this a big area. deal. So, welcome to MDOT MTA. Tell us a little bit about your role as director of Mark Train. Oh, role as director of Mark Train. <laughs> um, I equate it to, and this may not be appropriate, but an octopus. <laughs> it moves all the time and it has eight arms. But you know what? I think that's what makes me love it so much. It's, it's a challenge and it always is changing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the challenges, of course, you know, we have a lot of passengers and you have to keep them happy. Right. Sometimes there's bumps along the road. Sometimes a train doesn't come in on time. So, you know, it, it's, it's exciting. It's a lot that's yeah, going it, it on. It is, it's it a is. Lot that's I mean, going on. you know, additionally, we have uh, new, new trains that, new locomotives that uh, have been delivered. Um, so that's very exciting, and we're hoping now that, you know, we're going to get uh, further reliability. Mm -hmm. um, the trains, of course, they are Tier 4, which is, an, you know, an environmental improvement over what we have now. So I think that that's going to be, you know, exciting for people to see that out there. Give us a little sense of what your day-to-day -day operations are like. I know you said you're kind of all over the place and there's lots going on. but. You know, when you come in in the morning, what what do you do through the what day? What do I do to well, keep first, you know, train I, running? Right. Keep, first, first thing, first thing I do is I talk to people. I talk to staff. I mean, you know, really, they they are what makes Mark Train run. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not about me; it's about them, and they do a fantastic job. You know, we have, of course, you know, limited, you know, limited resources, um, and we have our two major contractors that we have to oversee, Amtrak and Bombardier, who operate and maintain our equipment. So there's a lot of interaction every day between staff, you know, our, our operators, maintenance. Then I go, you know, I try to go in and check with our MOCC, which is the Mark Operations Control Center. 
you know, to see how the trains are running. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to see, make sure that we, you know, haven't, you know, had any problems during the morning <laughs> rush hour. You know, those peak hours were always, you know, a little nerve rattling. Mm -hmm. We never know, you know. <laughs> All of a sudden you have a piece of equipment go down and then you have to make changes very, right, it's very quickly day. and it's very fast paced and, um, you know, that, that's sort of the start of the day, mm -hmm. you know, and then of course there's lots of meetings to attend, so. Always meetings, always, <laughs> always lots meetings. of meetings. So what prepared you for this job? Tell us a little bit about your background. I worked for a defense contractor way, way back in 2000, and that defense contractor took on the Metro overhaul. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my break into transportation. Mm -hmm. um, they asked me to come and work on the program, and I did. Then um, the Metro overhaul, of course, ended, and you know I went on to another contractor. But you know that that aside, I have been working in and around the MTA for 18 years, and you've been loving it ever since. Ever right? since <laughs> three years ago, um, almost to the day, I got the opportunity to go over to Mark Train and do all their financial budget management, and really gave me a good sense of what Mark is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're 95 percent contracted services. So when the opportunity arose to you know, be the director of Mark Train, it made I sense. Am. It sounds like it was Absolute. a good fit for Absolute. you. Absolutely. So now, how does Mark Train rank in comparison with other commuter services around the country? Size-wise, we're tenth in the nation. Okay. But we do have uh, one claim to fame, and that we are the only commuter railroad that can operate at 125 miles an hour, or up to 125 mm -hmm. miles an hour. Oh, okay. So that's, that's, awesome. that's significant. And I know you mentioned the new locomotives yes. that are coming. So what is the timing on that? Some of them actually arrived. Oh, okay. Yep. We mm -hmm. have two that arrived in January. They are now going through um, a series, of course, test commissioning. We've got engineers that are going through training, mm -hmm. mechanics that are going through training. So. Yesterday, we got two more locomotives, and they'll go through the same, you know, the same scenario of training test. Mm -hmm. So when will they actually be out for service? Well, I don't want to put a date on that okay. because, you know, the commissioning pro process, it's all about safety. Exactly. You know, we, mm -hmm. you know, we have to, you know, dot those I's, cross those T's, and make sure that everything is complete before we can actually go out there on the line. You have a lot happening with Mark Train. Are there any other upgrades that Mark Riders can look forward to or any other things that are happening with the system? Absolutely. Um, facilities wise, we have the BWI station mm -hmm. and the Camden station that are going through some revitalization and that will start in the spring. Oh, wow. So we're kind of excited about that. That's going to make a big difference. I think especially at BWI because we're seeing a lot of ridership you know, coming out of the airport you know, going to their destinations either north or south. But all is happening at BWI. Is it just the expansion or yes, some other it's things? Yes, it's an expansion of the uh, the station there. Mm -hmm. But you know, of course, like I said, it's just going to be an improvement overall for you know the passengers and track, you know, and Mark. Mm -hmm. We that's a shared station, so. right? And I know you've had an, a, a partnership with Amtrak for some time now. Yes. Many, okay. many years. <laughs> but that, it, it's a very good partnership. Mm -hmm. So tell us, what is your vision for Mark Train now that you're in your new role? My vision for Mark Train, of course, I want it to be the best commuter service it can be. And I want to give every passenger a great experience. You know, and my, my vision is to be out there, meet people, and of course, our you know, new equipment being online, you know, I'm really anticipating that people are going to see a big difference. That's awesome. Well, Andrea, it sounds like you are a very busy lady with a lot happening at Mark Train. Thank you so much for coming by and joining us on the show today. Thank you. That brings us to the end of another Commuter Connections program. We'll see you next time.